In this lesson, we're going to talk about imperial and colonial policy within the British Empire. And we're going to focus specifically on the period between you know, 1850 to the 1890s. And when we talk about colonial policy within the British Empire, especially within this context, we're really going to be talking about two major issues. We're going to be talking about the British administration of India following the Indian mutiny and the you know the efforts that were made to administer India um, you know more effectively, and we're also going to talk about international relations as a whole um, with other empires and the so-called scramble for Africa, which took place leading in past the 1850s and into the 1860s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. So, as an introduction to colonial policy, uh, when we're talking about the way in which um, the empire was administered. Um, through through policy, we're talking about the colonial office. Now, the colonial office was established by William Pitt, the Younger's government, in 1801. So this was before the you know the time period that we're studying in this course. But you know it's it's useful to useful to pick up on. Um, despite initially being part of the War Office, it had been separated into its own entity in 1854. So the colonial office and the war office had been merged into one at one point, um, generally being seen as you know kind of a foreign administration um, role, and then it had become separated in 1854. And also following 1854, uh, it was split into a number of departments. The empire was growing in size, and the departments had to be split into a number of uh, different sub departments, effectively. So we have the um, North America. The North American Department, Australia, West Indies, Africa, Mediterranean, and then there was from the eighteen seventies we have a uh, a general that you know a a, 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 a an office that doesn't really um, focus on any um, specific areas, but um, is a general um, colonial office. So we can see that the expansion of the British Empire needed uh, expansion within the um, administration of the British Empire, within colonial and imperial policy. So we are going to talk about the way in which it expanded into um, different sub-departments with all of these, uh, focusing on all of these different specific areas of, of the world, effectively. So that's, that's quite small to read, I do apologise for that, but um, uh, colonial office was headed by a colonial minister, Okay, and they were known as the Secretary of State for the Colonies. Just like today, you have a you know you have the Foreign Office, and that is um, something that is run by the Foreign Minister, and they are Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs or Secretary of State for Health if it's the Health Minister, etc., etc. We have a Colonial Office with a Colonial Minister who is Secretary of State for Colonies. Most politicians saw, if we're looking at the um, political. Um, implications of the colonial office. Most politicians saw this position as, as more of a stepping stone to, to bigger and better things. Just like how there are um, ministries of state in the UK at the moment um, that are seen as stepping stones to um, bigger and better things. The same was uh, with the colonial office. So it means that very few would stay there for more than one year or two. Many, very few secretaries of state but that being said, there were a number of very long-serving colonial secretaries from the years 1857 to 1890. So we have people like the Duke of Newcastle, who was um, in charge from 1859 to 1878. We have the uh, Earl of Kimberley, 1870 to 1874, a little bit shorter. And we have uh, Lord Nutsford, who was uh, 1887 to 1892, again a little bit shorter than the, the Duke of Newcastle. And effectively... Um, as the progress of the 1800s led to the rapid expansion of the British Empire that we talked about in the last lesson specifically with relation to Africa, the colonial office um, began to have a lot more, um, a much more increased workload. Okay, and that's why we see expansion and what we talked about in the last slide. So, as a result of this huge expansion of the British Empire and the expansion of the workload, a single centralized colonial office was becoming ever more difficult to manage effectively and so the colonial office uh, began to delegate work of the empire as the expansion continued to grow so for example following the indian mutiny of 1857 which is what we're going to be talking about in the next lesson 
Oh, sorry, in the next slide, sorry. Uh, a separate Indian office uh, would deal with the administration of India in the Far East. So we're starting to see delegations and the the real catalyst for this this delegation of, of, of work um, to a separate office was the Indian mutiny. So with that being said, we're going to talk about the administration of India. It's, a, it's within the period of 1854 to 1890. So the expansion of British control over India um, has originally been overseen by the British East India Company. So we talked about um, the role of, of corporations and companies within the context of the Suez Canal and uh, the Suez Company. And just like that, we have the British East India Company, which was... Um, effectively in control of administration and had a, a monopoly over over administration of India. And by monopoly, we mean they have um, sole um, sole control of the market within within that area. And so, under the control of the company, millions of subjects had been added to the empire by conquest or annexation. So we have seen that as the British Empire expanded, the British East India Company expanded with it, and millions and millions of people um, were con continually being um, placed effectively under the veil of, of the British Empire um, by conquest or by annexation. So the administration of India was a vastly expansive task, a vastly expensive task as well. So for example, the cost of government in India was not that much less than the cost of that of the Brit of Britain itself so the army um, and and as a result the you know um, military forces stationed in the air will become increasingly larger and larger so we can tell that I mean we know just by ge ge you know, geographically the control of India is is a monumental task and it's something that um, took a lot of um, a lot of money a lot of expansive and expensive um, it was an expensive task, effectively. And so also we see the army being stationed, um, growing in size as as the size of the uh, veil of control began to grow as well. So the British East India Company had been granted a monopoly over English trade with Asia in 1600. So effectively any kind of trade with, with any English trade with Asia would be done under the veil of the British East India Company from the year 1600s within the entire area of Asia. And the company was to rule India until 1858, so a very considerable amount of time. However, what we saw in 1857 was the Indian Mutiny, okay? And the Indian Mutiny had lasted about a year, and it led to over a thousand deaths, okay? It led to thousands of deaths. And you can we can deduce from the policies that were put into place by the British Empire following the Indian Mutiny, just how important India was to the British Empire. So the British sent troops to bolster the support of the East India Company, which shows their desire to retain India. And also following the mutiny, it became clear that a new administration was needed to run India. So in 1858, the East India Company was dissolved and the control of India was put into the hands of the British government themselves. And that very same year, the government of India was passed. So the Government of India Act of 1858 effectively established a number of things. So the first thing it was established was that the East India Company was to be dissolved and the company's territories, the areas in which um, the company you know, uh, had control over, were to be passed to Queen Victoria. So they were going to go under the veil of the crown. We also find that we have a new um, a, a creation of a new Secretary of State, the Secretary of State for India. Again, another uh, another uh, cabinet position, and this Secretary of State received power and duties that were um, formally performed by the East India Company. So what we are seeing is, with the Government of India Act, effectively all of the the roles and the duties of the of the East India Company um, were transferred and delegated to the government, and we also established a fifteen member council that would to, uh, assist the Secretary of State in issues relating to Indian affairs. And we also see a um, the, the transfer of control of the Indian Civil Service being put under the control of the Secretary of State. Okay. So when it comes to the administration of India, we have got this Government of India Act that 
um, established the the Secretary of State for Indian Affairs, and we um, start to look at uh, the the administration of India as a whole uh, following the following the dissolution of the East India Company. So the Viceroy, who was a Crown appointed Viceroy to replace the Company's Governor General, so the, the person in control, would rule India uh, with a Legislative Council. Okay, and this legislative count this legislative council would consist of five members in different policy areas. Okay, so this so the viceroy effectively uh, replaced the East India Company's governor general, the person in charge, effectively. So we have areas of finance, areas of law, areas relating to the army and military uh, services. We have areas relating to the economy, and we have areas relating to home affairs. Okay, so we have this legislative council that would um, instruct and 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 rule India with uh, within these um, five areas of policy. So during the years of the Raj which was a period of time going from around 1858 to 1948, the area on which the, the time in which uh, the British government was uh, in control of India, okay, the government made it a priority to maintain and hold power over, over India. And this was the case for the entire Raj period. So we have, the like I mentioned just then, 1858 to 1948. And... Effectively, running the Raj required a lot of staff, and this was maintained by around 1,000 um, British civil servant staff. And we also see the position of being a member of the civil service within India uh, was a very sought-after job position uh, with a very good salary. And there was also a need for cooperation with Indian natives. So this was something that um, was introduced um, for, with the Government of India Act and the and the transfer of power to the British government. So the Viceroy, who I've just mentioned in the last slide, was the effective Governor General, who was you know the person who the person who ruled over India. Uh, they relied on native rulers, okay, and they were these native rulers were in charge of 565 um, normally, uh, you know, nominally uh, independent princely states, and they also introduced what we call the doctrine of lapse, which is where whenever a princely state, one of these 565 states, uh, would fall, um, would uh, the the line of descent the uh, of their of their rulers would end when that line of descent would end then that state would automatically fall under british rule so that's a very interesting doctrine of lamps so people so effectively the 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 control of india would be something that would be ever growing and control over india control over different parts of india would increase when we talk about administrative functions uh, the administrative the administrative functions performed um, by this array of officials that we have already um, outlined, people like the civil service and the viceroy and etc. etc. Um, they would um, control the collection of taxes, they would maintain law and order within India, they also ran the judiciary, the court system, and generally what we are seeing is that a legal system developed when the old uh, East India Company courts were merged with the Crown Courts and English law. So we're starting to see a, a, a convergence of, of legal systems. And it just goes to show just how um, vast and expansive the East India Company was when since 1600s to 1858, the East India Company effectively had developed its own court system, its own military um, personnel, and its monopoly over trade with the rest of Asia made it extremely wealthy. And generally speaking, from the position of the Indian population, um, when all these you know these changes were made, the shift from the company rule to the crown rule made very little difference on the on the whole, on the face of it. However, there were um, there was some indications um, that sections of the Indian population uh, showed an increase in political awareness and political um, participation. So, for example, we have things like the eighteen eighty five Indian National Congress. And as I mentioned in the last, in a, a couple of slides ago, the impact of the mutiny was was um, 
was very um, stark on the British Empire. They were very, very clearly, um, very clearly shaken by by the idea of of this mutiny becoming uh, a mutiny becoming successful and, and and taking over control of India. So it was very clear that a prevention of the further mutiny was uh, their top priority during this period. So there was attempts to prevent further mutiny and from 1858 efforts were made to strengthen the british indian army so indian army within so the british army within india and the east india company's armies were brought under the control of the crown and we also see um with that we have the increase uh, with over 70,000 troops and 125,000 native troops um being administered into the into this um british uh, indian army in by the late 1880s and so there were also policies that were to ensure that the native regiments were not situated together and implemented um, so that the chances that a mutiny would be rarer so we have um, you know different different uh, native regiments being split up and mixed within all of the British regiments to ensure that no one area no one um, you know group of regiments would have enough power to, to mutiny so these were just a number of administrative um, reforms and administrative changes that would make it just a, a little bit more difficult for a mutiny to take place and there were also um, technological developments that took place within within this period of Indian uh, British control over India, where three thousand miles of track were added, and this was following the decade of the mutiny. This was um, partly a technological innovation; they wanted to innovate technologically, but also it made it easier for if there was ever to be a mutiny, they um, it would been it would have it, sorry it was a, a lot easier for the British army uh, and for the British Empire to send troops to different areas of India um, via this new three thousand miles of track. So, with that being said, let's talk about the second aspect of the imperial and colonial policy in the British Empire at this period of time, which is talking about the international relations and the scramble for Africa. So by the late 1800s, we have seen a an increase in the power of different empires on the on the international stage. So, for example, in 1871, we see the unification of Germany into a single state, and the unification of Germany led to um, Germany becoming increasingly more and more economically prosperous within Europe. We also see at the same time. Um, the bolstering of the French Empire and we see places like Russia becoming more and more rapidly industrializing states and therefore you know a rapidly um, growing economy. France began to expand its territory in Asia in 1884 and Russia had began to expand its borders um, by taking areas um, in places like Afghanistan. And so we also see um, concern from the British Empire when naval programs uh, in France and Russia in the late 1880s were beginning to take hold as well. So we're seeing imperial expansion from other places like France, Russia and uh, Germany and Portugal, all of these different places. And the British response was really to um, to try and to try and race for annexation and conquest over different areas within the world. So, for example, the British response to French activity in Indochina was to annex territory in Malaya from 1874. We also see uh, they expanded their base in Singapore, something that was established in 1819. As well as this, oops, I'm sorry. As well as this, the British expanded to uh, Sarawak and North Borneo in 1881, uh, to Brunei in 1885, and to Upper Burma, Burma in 1885 as well. So, as we can see, with the expansion of the French within Indochina in places like Vietnam and, and all these areas, the British response was to um, expand there as well. And the same um, can be said for uh, the scramble for Africa. So when we talk about the scramble for Africa, the resulting uh, of these international developments, so these, this, this growing imperial expansion from all of these different empires, um, 
there were two conferences that were held to facilitate the Europeans' access to control over African territory. So we have the Brussels Conference in 1876, and we also have the Berlin Conference in 1884 to 1885. These two conferences effectively were the decision-making um, conferences to decide uh, who was to control different areas of Africa. And this is really where the scramble for Africa began, the, the race to to try and grab as much land and conquest and annexation of much as much area in Africa as possible. So beginning with the Brussels Conference in 1876, King Leopold of Belgium hosted the conference um, from the leaders of all of the geographical uh, societies across Europe. And the main motivation of the Brussels Conference was to protect Belgian interests in the Congo. So it was a really self-interested conference. King Leopold wanted to protect um, Belgian interests. And it came to a number of conclusions. A number of conclusions were made at this conference. And the first one was that Africans were incapable of developing the natural resources and thus European intervention was needed. So the classic imperial colonial um, mindset that effectively that was the Africans were unable to um, were un unable to um, you know develop natural resources and therefore the the you know the 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 very smart Europeans were able to, had to come in to try and uh, to try and teach them how to do it and to do it for them incredibly stupid a very 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 stupid idea but anyway uh, routes to Africa also routes to Africa's lakes needed to be developed by building roads and railways and finally uh, the an international African association was to be established as well so effectively they decided that a um, Africans needed um, to we needed to uh, use their natural resources and um, use our um, industrial skills to develop their natural resources. They also decided that you know the routes to Africa's lakes needed to be developed more, and we also saw the establishment of an international African association. The Berlin Conference of 1884 and 1885 was a lot more um, extensive. So although the scramble for Africa had already begun at this point, the Berlin Conference it was a an increased sign that there was to be more competition in Africa, more international competition from Europe. And it was the German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck who initiated the Berlin Conference to make a number of decisions about uh, Africa. And effectively, it was attended by the representatives of 14 states, which included the USA, France, Germany, Great Britain and Portugal. And the conference began with the underlying assumption that the basins and, and the mouths of the Congo and Niger rivers uh, would remain neutral and open to trade. Because effectively, when you've got two different areas um, of, you know, two different areas of Africa, say, that are under control, uh, that are under control by two different empires, it's very difficult for, um, for, for to facilitate trade if one of those areas has complete, um, you know, a monopolizing control over over the trading routes. And the trading routes within Africa, within the center of Africa, were effectively the uh, rivers and the lakes and stuff. So, as a result, they wanted to ins ensure that these areas, um, especially the Congo and Niger rivers, would remain neutral and open to trade to facilitate um, free trade across Africa. The conference concluded with the signing of a general act which incorporated a number of things. So for example, the first thing they did was that all, no uh, all nations should be permitted to trade in the basin of the Congo and its outlets. So we can see that the that we can see that there is areas of, of free trade. Uh, so no one area, so no one state, shall we say, uh, no one empire has um, a monopoly over trade within the basin of the Congo. And there should also be free trade uh, in these regions as well within the Congo and its outlets. So the powers um, with influence in the area should also help to protect indigenous people and suppress the slave trade. Don't forget the slave trade was uh, abolished the slave trade with Africa uh, to the Americas was abolished um, long before this uh, Berlin conference. And so obviously there was areas that were still going with illegal slave trade. And so 
we have um, efforts to try and protect the indigenous people and trying to suppress the slave trade there. And the powers that were involved in this uh, conference ought to support and protect religious, scientific or charitable undertakings. So they wanted to try and um, facilitate more altruistic, um, a more altruistic approach to colonial policy. And when we're talking about the legacy of the Berlin Conference and the, co the concept of effective opposition, uh, occupation, uh, the Berlin Conference established the principle of effective occupation. So this was really where uh, a European power could assert a claim to a piece of land if it had been effectively occupied uh, and had notified other powers. So, for example, if there was an un so a, an area of land that was not taken over by an empire within Africa, uh, the British Empire, for example, could take over that area, have what we call effective occupation of that area, and if they um, have notified the other powers that they have effective occupation of that area then they have the legal authority to assert claim to the land that they have effective occupation over and the berlin conference initiated and perpetuated the scramble for africa and by the 1900 90 percent of the continent was in the hands of the europeans within the hands of european empires and so therefore Africa was seen by historians as an area of peaceful co competition between the European powers. There were some historians that would take the view that it was a, a sort of a way to prevent um, large conflict within the European powers if we have peaceful economic co competition within Africa. And one point one thing that we should note from the berlin conference uh, quite interestingly was that no african representation was at the berlin conference it was a decision um, made by a number of people from european great powers to assert claim over an area of land that effectively they had no right to assert claim over but this is that is the view coming from a, a very um somebody who has obviously a lot of hindsight in the year 2021 in the next lesson, we're going to be talking about trade and commerce within the British Empire, and then we're going to talk about um, the 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 more the more personal, the more human aspects of the British Empire, different imperial explorers, and and the the impact that they had on the expansion of the empire within the fifties, the eighteen fifties to the eighteen nineties.